welcome back to the class uh, we are continuing um, our discussion on some of the important people who shaped uh, sociology and social anthropology in its uh, formative uh, years and in this week we have been discussing the uh, indological approach and uh, we already had uh, i think two uh, sessions uh, talking uh, one session uh, trying to understand what is indological perspective and then uh, two sessions on uh, one, maybe one of the most important uh, figures in the indological tradition that is uh, gs uh, gurie in the previous class we had a discussion of one of his very popular uh, articles on uh, you know on, on the features of caste system so today we are looking at yet another uh, important person that to a lady uh, sociologist and anthropologist uh, professor airavathi karve and uh, she is uh, so so i have uh, this very uh, useful uh, essay written by uh, professor nandini sundar this essay is uh, again taken from the edited book uh, by uh, patricia obroy uh, you know uh, satish despante uh, which is titled uh, the you know which is an edited book on the development of anthropology in india i have mentioned that book in the in the reference uh, section in one of the previous uh, classes so let us uh, get to that uh, uh, article it's a lengthy article which uh, looks into her uh, you know biological background her, her family situation her uh, educational trajectory and it also has very detailed analysis about uh, you know her academic career her uh, professional career so we may not be able to go into in, into into uh, each one of them in 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 depth but uh, i i hope to provide you with a very broad overview of her uh, life and work let's go to the essay so this is the uh, title the course of anthropology life and uh, uh, work of airavathi karve by nandini sundar so you know the, the one of the most important uh, points about dr airavathi karve is not only her seminal contributions uh, to the formation of sociology and its its orientation in a very particular manner but also because uh, she was one of the or she was the uh, airavathi karve was india's first woman anthropologist at a time when sociology and anthropology were still developing as uh, you know uh, as university disciplines and here is a family photograph and uh, this is professor uh, airavathi airavathi karve sitting um, in this uh, in this right hand uh, side uh, others are her mother and her father in law and her uh, husband so um, uh, she was also the founder of anthropology at uh, pune university an indologist who mined sanskrit texts for sociological features and anthropometrist a serologist and paleontologist a collector of folk songs a translator of feminist poems and marathi writer and essayist of no mean repute whose book yugantha transformed our understanding of the mahabharata so it's it's a very very uh, you know it's it's a towering personality in terms of her uh, you know academic uh, credentials are con con considered she was a trained anthropologist and that too uh, trained in in, in a kind of a particular kind of physical uh, anthropology she was she was also into uh, the you know paleontologist she was a collector of folk songs and uh, also marathi writer and this book is is very very uh, uh, important and popular so it's it's a very important uh, personality in terms of her academic contribution but uh, nandini sundar makes an argument that uh, even though uh, she had made so so much of huge contributions uh, her works are not kind of discussed in the contemporary period yet although karve was very well known in her times especially in her native maharashtra and gets an honorable mention in stand, standard histories of sociology and anthropology she does not seem to have had lasting effect on the discipline in the way some of the her contemporaries such as boz gurie elvin or dumo had and uh, we will we will uh, she try to understand why that kind of a situation that happened uh, so um, again uh, the kind of work that uh, karve did was very very broad in terms of its intellectual orientations and it was very very uh, you know uh, very very uh, very very courageous for her to have looked into uh, so many different uh, uh, areas so karve's work stretched from mapping kinship and caste underpinned by anachronistic anthropometric and linguistic surveys uh, anthropometric survey is is something what was um, uh, you know very very uh, uh, common uh, during that time 
where uh, you know people's physical features were measured on the base of using some some specific scales and and this uh, uh, the, the scales were used to categorize people into this these indices were formed on the base of people's physical uh, you know or you know physiological features like the you know the the cephalic index or the nasal index or or the or or the, or the height of the body the proportion of the body and on the base of this anthropometric uh, met, met, uh, anthropometrists people were you know categorized into different uh, different races so uh, anthropomet and linguistic surveys so surprisingly uh, contemporary surveys of the status of women using census data urbanization weekly market dam displaced people and pastoralists equally perhaps uh, it's her life as an unconventional woman of letters and her dedication to scholarship her cosmopolitanism as well as immersion in a particular regional context that will continue to be of interest it's, it's a very uh, interesting um, you know personality while she uh, had uh, the opportunity to go to germany and and then uh, have ha had her their education there but still uh, she was of course a feminist but still uh, uh, you know she she had a very very Im important influence of uh, of of maharashtra culture on her so uh, that's very uh, interesting set of observations that they are making now the praxis of research from puneri brahmin to professional anthropology it's a, it's a biological sketch uh, you can read this if uh, you are interested i'm just touching upon some of the important things recent histories of introduction of anglo education in western india note that rather than representing greater universalization of access to education colonial education policies in fact helped to consolidate small groups of upper caste particularly brahmins in the new professions like civil service law journalism uh, and teaching a uh, prominent among these upper caste were the chitpavan brahmins who had dominated social and political life under peshwas and now moved to restore their position from the relative decline they had suffered after the initial establishment of the british rule and uh, this is the story you know must be true with uh, every region the 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 initial form initial waves of modernization was made used by this uh, you know the the people who belong to the upper caste and upper class and they they embraced this possibilities of education foremost and then made made use of going abroad getting a professional degree and then uh, which helped them to uh, occupy uh, a a more settled prestigious job in india and uh, it's an elaboration about uh, uh, about how uh, you know ira vadikarve who uh, was born into a very illustrious family uh, made use of that gender as chakravarti uh, points out uh, was critical to both reformist and the orthodox each of whom identified the real hindu tradition with their particular stance on gender and quoted from the shastras to prove that while the orthodox upheld brahmanical patriarchy the reformers merely sought to moderate it with paternalist humanism among other things in order to make women into suitable uh, helpmates for a new class of educated man uh, it, it's it's a uma chakravarti is very important is a very interesting um, you know uh, work about how uh, how gender uh, was understood and negotiated in this early period of uh, of of reformism because gender was a concern for both orthodox as well as the reformists but uh, each of these discourses worked within a kind of a very given set of parameters uh, a very, very interesting set of analysis so uh, it, it 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 this particular section basically tries to you know locate uh, iravati karve's position as an upper caste brahmin woman uh who uh you know was born in that particular time and how her life trajectory was influenced by this larger uh you know mechanisms iravadi uh, studied philosophy at ferguson college graduating in 1926 26 uh, she then got the dakshina fellowship uh to work under gs kurie head of the department of sociology at bombay university in the meantime she married the chemist dinagar dondo and uh, there are you know discussions about how dinagar dondo had already you know gone Uh, to europe to get his education and uh, and uh, that uh, uh, you know and he encouraged uh, iravati karve to go for a uh, for, for higher studies for a phd there in in germany and uh, even though uh, her father in law was seen as a reformer uh, he was not in, uh, in in favor of sending her uh, his daughter in law to uh, germany but his <coughs> her husband uh, uh, persisted so she finally she had a opportunity to go to germany so those a uh, biographical uh, you know things are given there very very interesting set of uh, uh, points yeah and the some some interesting uh, vignettes about her uh, 
you know personal life as well not only did airavati and dinakar call call each other iru and dinu the children called them by those names as well something again you know very uh, not very common uh, this was an often source of amusement or surprise to the children's friends as was airavati karve's refusal to wear any signs of married hindu women such as kumkum or mangal sutra she was also the first woman in pune to ride a scooter scooter her appearance was evidently an important factor in the overall myth of her persona almost every one who wrote about her uh, or who described her to me emphatically emphasized uh, how em- imposing she was tall fair and well built so you know her her personal uh, life uh, how distinctly she decided to live that kind of a personal life despite her disregard for convention iravati karves karves was essentially a middle class hindu life her interest and uh, scholarship made possible by particular hindu reform mindset reformist pune brahmins retained a sense of tradition a way of introducing a maharashtrian audience to the wider world through the middle class sensibility and she also kind of epitomized that so there are you know that, that's a point getting emphasized here now the next section guru shishya tradition in anthropology it, it talks about uh, her relationship with uh, her uh, studentship with the gs guri and how uh, that influenced uh, tracing the intellectual antecedents of a scholar can be hard and somewhat speculative task in karve's case there appears to be uh, at least four major influences her work the first was an indological tradition to uh, which both her ma supervisor gs guri and she subscribed the second was an ethnological tradition which manifested itself in surveys of caste and tribes within india and had broader affinities with with what later came to be called as a diffusionism and diffusionism again we discussed in the previous uh, class as in the case of uh, when we discussed uh, uh, you know gs gurie uh, the third influence was that of a german physical anthropological tradition which attempted to provide a genetic basis for the existence of a variety of groups which she imbibed during her phd in germany uh in her case fortunately this was shown of its racist implications uh you know uh, that this particular kind of a uh you know providing scientific explanation providing very rational explanation for the biological differences of people was one of the major uh you know uh, so ma- major major foundation for uh, racist uh, kind of thinking during uh, during during the hitler's time so the scientific racism which believed that people can be or people are different uh, biologically people are different genetically uh, was the main reason why you know hitler uh, could even imagine a world uh, of of fully uh, or or world dominated by the superior genes superior people that whom he called it as a aryans but uh, uh, nandini sundar says that uh, uh, you know uh, though she used this anthropometric kind of material to or uh, to to categorize people she did not kind of subscribe to that kind of a racist understanding finally her own curiosity and passion for field work led her to take up new areas of research like socio economic surveys or archaeological explorations in sangalia guri's influence uh, is apparent much of karve karve's work they shared a common belief in the importance of family kinships kinship caste and religion as the base of any society a broad equation of indian society with hindu society and an emphasis on collecting empirical facts which would speak for themselves so this is again we have come across in the previous class how uh, you know uh, guria had this very strong belief that india represents a hindu uh, civilizational character and and these institutions are something very important so but that was heavily influenced by the the, the centrality of hindu religion in india and indological traditions that karve subscribed to was of a very different order from dumos uh, in that there was no attempt to building or eliciting an underlying model of social relation and this we will discuss later how uh, what was the kind of a uh, you know indological uh, uh, idea that uh, louis dumo subscribed to and and that is very different from the kind of indological tradition that uh, you know gurie or or other uh, anthropologists really subscribe to that we will discuss that data instead she was an indologist in the classical orientalist sense of looking into ancient sanskrit texts for insights into contemporary practice and this again was one of the important uh, forms of engaging with the uh, or, or creating indian knowledge and uh, and even now there are people who are kind of uh, want to 
you know, believe or resurrect that kind of an argument. This kind of ideology had clear affinities with uh, ethnology and diffusionism. And though uh, tracing all the details is outside the scope of this essay, uh, the common substratum was the European discovery of Sanskrit as a part of the Indo-European language stream and the influence of the Aryan invasion theory on the classification of Indian population. So, uh, we again had a uh, you know brief discussion about how diffusionism in, in, in Europe uh, emerged as an alternative uh, framework to that of evolutionism. Okay, so here the, the basic idea was how different set of people, different population groups, uh, you know, get diffused or different cultural traits get diffused among different different uh, geographic area and how new population, new countries, new uh, people get uh, evolved. So, 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 so that particular uh, focus was something, uh, you know, Airavati Karva was very much influenced uh, with. And uh, yeah, one of the political implications of this was that cultural diversity within an area was prima facie evidence that its inhabitants were a racially diverse collection of migrant settlers. The diffusionist belief that the culture progress occurred as a result of inferior race scoping, uh, the superior copying, the superior uh, upon contact or conquest also fitted well with the Oringless theory of an Aryan conquest of Dravidian. So, this is also the time when Aryan invasion theory was, uh, you know, considered to be a very, uh, as, as a standard model to understand in Indian society. So, uh, her, uh, you know, interest in uh, anthropology, her interest in diffusionism and this particular history of, of uh, uh, Aryan invasion also really fitted that well. Though Gurie, through Gurie, who was a student of rivers at Cambridge, Carvey internalized the understanding of cultural variation in society as a result of the migration of different ethnic groups and a historical approach. Her book, Hindu Society, begins by noting the bewildering variety of behavioral pattern found in it and goes on to attribute it to the endogenous skin groups which she called caste and which though through her anthropometric and blood group surveys, she showed to be often distinct from each other. So, that is how she went on to study this um, kind of distinct groups. Then uh, there is a discussion about uh, her MA thesis uh, under uh, Gurie, uh, what she worked on uh, other thing. It was on her own caste, Chitpavan Brahmins. So, uh, she says Chitpavan Brahmins, an ethnic study was the title. It is a classic example of a physical anthropology uh, because she went on to uh, measure the, the, the people, she measured the eye color of the people, she measures the, the other anthropometry geometric indices, uh, combined with an ideological discussion of caste origin in the form of the uh, Parasurama myth drawn from the popular versions of the Puranas, written in the speculative style of Gazetteer. So, that was how uh, she, you know, prepared her uh, MA uh, dissertation and original uh, research. And uh, then she moves to Germany for doing a uh, PhD. Uh, German anthropology at the time was dominated by a, a physicalist tradition owing to the fact that anthropology was generally studied as a branch of medicine, very interesting, uh, you know, history of, uh, you know, this development of this particular, uh, you know, discipline. So, so that uh, definitely, uh, you know, influenced uh, Carvey's uh, intellectual thinking and, and disciplinary orientation. Some of the support, vein, uh, yeah, uh, her supervisor was, uh, you know, uh, was somebody who was involved in this eugenics uh, movement, which believed that, you know, you can, you can work on genetics and then create uh, a, a racially, biologically superior set of people by eliminating all uh, other uh, inferior kind of people. So, uh, so she, she was accused of, of, of being a party to Nazi uh, campaign, but later he, uh, you know, got free from that. Uh, some of the support waned uh, when in 1933 he declared his support of, uh, for the Nazis. The Kaiser William Institute trained SS physicians in genetic and racial care. And Fisher, Fisher was the name of his uh, her uh, supervisor, personally served as a judge in Berlin's appellate genetic health court, the purpose of which was to determine who could be sterilized. So, uh, she, she he had a very, you know, very close connection with uh, the Nazi movement. Fortunately, although Carvey evidently imbibed uh, some eugenics inclinations from Fisher, she escaped any stronger racist influence. Perhaps one safety net was provided by her location as a colonized Indian. Um, 
you know again in interesting observations because uh, uh, if if you are into a particular intellectual tradition which was which 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 believed in the scientificity of eugenics and as a phd student you also would would, would naturally follow that but uh, uh, nandini sundar you know observes that that did not really happen in the case of uh, uh, iravati karve maybe also because of the fact that she was not one of these german people who could uh, easily believe in that but she was an indian um, a person of indian origin to summarize though the combined through the combined effects of diffusionism colonial gazetteer style ethnology and german human genetics it was inevitable for carve to come to understand her task primarily as one of the mapping social and biological variations in society so so that turned out to be the most important uh, task uh, that iravidi carve uh, you know identified for herself then this coming section is about building academic institutions uh, in india how she served the department of uh, and uh, anthropology and sociology in pune university so uh, or in uh, before that in SS sndt uh, university and others after returning from germany carve worked for a while as a registrar of the sndt women's university in bombay where she was apparently an indifferent administrator she also did some postgraduate teaching in bombay in 1939 she joined a newly revived deccan college as a reader in sociology and uh, this proved to be a uh, congenial intellectual home for the rest of her life so she uh, studied uh, she she worked in the deccan college uh, throughout according to her colleague the archaeologist h t sankalia non interference in the work of others faith in competence of the individuals as well as the complete freedom to plan and execute one scheme of research within the means at our disposal was the main lay responsible for a rapid development of deccan college so uh, yeah Iravati Karve as work was more indological drawing upon ancient texts to explain the present and using anthropometric data to supplement her interpretation with the hard facts while Damle by his own testimony was more concerned with the contemporary social analysis and issues of power and authority Damle was uh, her colleague in uh, Deccan uh, college while Damle wanted to uh, analyze the survey in terms of contemporary theory Karve insisted merely on presenting the facts and letting people do their own interpretation act okay. she con consciously eschewed contact with any new sociological theory for instance there was a, some consternation when damle began to teach talcott parsons and uh, talcott parsons is uh, you know even even that time was considered to be quite an influential uh, scholar who propounded the structural functionalist theory both in her research and in her teaching this carve remained an old fashioned anthropologist combining the four field approach archaeology physical anthropology linguistics and cultural anthropology so so that was her forte that was her uh, you know mainstay uh, in in research combining archaeology uh, and then physical anthropology linguistics and cultural anthropology yeah all, all these discussions are about her interaction with the other fellow uh, you know fellow uh, sociologists of that particular time g s uh, d n majumdar k n bose i p d h i m n c nivas and others in those days pune university drew students from various parts of india particularly kerala where there were no sociology courses carve's ma course on social biology the biological basis of human society and indian sociology tend to be based on whatever she happened to be working on at that time or was interested in rather than a basic course which had to be covered and would combine anthropometric observations with examples drawn from hindu epic or transmitted conversationally while she walked around the class or sat at a table so uh, observations about how she taught certain papers and how her classes were uh, kind of uh, arranged or ca classes were held like science subjects today where phd students often work on aspects of a larger project initiated by supervisor iravati carve's physical anthropology phd students were usually assigned subjects that would uh, enforce her larger thesis about the independent origin of jati or caste so this is again uh, something that we saw in guriye's case as well he would uh, you know send uh, his students to to far away places to collect material uh, to be used by him later without uh, you know uh, providing adequate uh, or the ship rights and other things so here also she uh, he says that uh, nandini sundar says that uh, iravati carve all, also 
made use of her uh, you know phd candidates to work on her project so this is a list of people who went to different places and uh, then uh, you know worked on areas that were used or th that that constituted the main focus of ida carve's uh, work or individual stories anecdotes how uh, you know hard it was to get money uh, to get these projects going all these things Now, her take on this ways of apprehending the world fieldwork. The best introduction to Carvey's fieldwork method comes from the first chapter of Kingship Organization India. Research started in Maharashtra in 1938-39 and extended to other places over a number of years before the book was published, finally published in 1953. I moved from region to region taking measurements, blood samples and collecting information about kinship practices and terminology. the contacts were established through friends students and government officials supposing i had an acquaintance in darwar in karnataka i would make that my first station and then get introduced to the friends or relations whose acquaintance do in their own turn would me would take me to their homes and villages so that i travel from place to place never knowing where my next step was to be nor where my next meal would come from uh, very interesting you know observations about how she went on doing uh, the kind of field work a kind of a snowball uh, sampling if you may uh, were to say in 1950s uh, the kind of extensive field work had lost its attraction uh, year long intensive studies of a village or a tribe in a restricted region were in fashion and contemporary anthropological criticism of her kinship work focused on the fact that the linguistic terminology she collected was not ethnographically grounded in the uh, life of particular uh, caste dumo dumo's criticism very important criticism we will see that later however ethnographic field work of the malinoskian sort is no longer seen as the only natural mode of doing anthropology involving a rediscovery of some older alternative or uh, different national uh, tradition so that's a time where there was so much of debate about the kind of ethnographic uh, uh, work the old fashioned uh, thing of you know staying in a village for for a year was not uh, seen as as the only way of doing uh, doing doing uh, research uh, there are you know examples about how she uses uh, illustrations about how she you know took the help of students and then you know work on a very uh, shoestring budget to to conduct uh, studies uh, as she grew older and after two heart attacks carve stopped doing field work altogether all her latest survey work was carried out by her co-authors while carve helped with the designing the questionnaire and analysis ironically her scholarly work was not ethnographic her literary writings in marathi were exemplars of a delicate balance between involvement involved and detached participant observation her daily immersion in the social life of maharashtra was trans transformed with sociologist and writers eye into flashes of rare insights and vivid portraits of culture in some of the very nuanced passages so these are some of these observations made by uh, nandini uh, sundar not uh, you know how her many of their uh, literary how her literary works or creative works were uh, infused with sociological understandings and insights now appraising carve's work celebrating the diversity of india but this india according to carve and a lot of others was a was seen only as a kind of hindu india a comprehensive bibliography of carve's work prepared by kc malhotra just after her death list 102 articles and books in english and books in english uh, eight books in marathi several unpublished papers and several ongoing projects her anthropological output in english can be grouped under four different heads though her most important contribution was really the way in which one filed one field fed to another not only is the range remarkable but it's quite unique among her contemporaries the kind of breadth that she had and the kind of a uh, you know unique way of doing certain things one is this physical anthropology and archaeology as we discussed uh, which is hardly now been uh, studied by any of the sociologists of the present time anthropometric and blood group investigations and excavation of stone age skeletons second is cultural anthropology kinship caste folk songs epics oral traditions which is uh, you know very uh, very common today 
and then socio economic surveys weekly markets dam displays people urbanization pastoral list special organization and finally contemporary social comment women language race etc so so this uh, you know it's just a very uh, exhaustive list very uh, very curious list of uh, interest presented by a scholar so uh, her observations about indian society uh, caste religion family um, i'm not reading it out you can read it uh, later these valuable cultural traits are described as tolerance and an awareness of diversity uh, she tries to uh, you know conceptualize indian civilization as a as a mosaic of different uh, cultures and, and and identities and how it comes together uh, while caste and joint families may have been oppressive of specific individuals they also provided security however this diversity and tolerance are seen as largely hindu attributes and ultimately it is a high brahmanical culture that provides direction to that unity so so that's a very uh, interesting uh, idea which is again kind of revived very very strongly uh, in the current in, in the contemporary times that the a kind of a hindu ethology hindu myth, uh, hindu hindu uh, ethics and hindu moral system is the is the you know is, is the main driving force behind indian civilization in this carve was not very different from gurie or indeed most other indian sociologists to the present who have followed a path of benign neglect towards minorities uh, those you know muslims and christians and uh, when not actively excluding them from the definition of indian culture and and that is very evident uh, now these minorities uh, irrespective of whether they are too tiny a minority or not they are not seen as a kind of a national uh, self in the, indeed in this sociology has by and large been unable to free itself from the standard hindu consensus its hindu character often concealed through the rhetoric of nationalism and social universality about the greater tolerance of hinduism the unity of india was always been a cultural unity based on an uninterrupted literary and religious tradition of thousands of years the learned brahmin uh, to whatever region he belonged reads the vedas brahmanas smritis whether it was drama or poetry or grammar or politics or logics or philosophy whatever excellence or mediocrity was created up to the threshold of this recently owed it from or matter to classical or vedic literature so she's she's very clear that she can she she uh, understands it as a you know linear uh, connection uh, uh, with with vedic uh, literature and uh, vedas however there is no attempt even at a sociological understanding of how differently christianity and islam might operating in the indian context equally importantly because the sociological tendency to see religion as a social glue as a fetishized uh, equivalent of society uh, itself sociologists have been unable to escape from the rap of colonial historiography even when attempting a uh, supposedly historical reading of culture while carve considered that linguistic regions cross cut religious unity uh, here again muslims and christians are seen as deviant elements and the blame for partition laid solely at the doors of the muslim league uh, so there are, there are some very uh, uh, maybe problematic observations about uh, about muslims in this particular paragraph so uh, nandini sundar says that she also belonged to a group or a group of intellectuals in that particular time who uh, imagined india basically as an hindu uh, india the need to acknowledge pluralism is also evident in her view of social issues like language and schooling she retained a strong marathi nationalism which was probably enhanced by the samyukta maharashtra movement and refused to concede hindi superior uh, uh status as a national language or allow english to dominate access to civil service all primary education she insisted must be in one of the regional languages and there should be no english medium schools at all you know uh, an argument that we might find it problematic now uh, her major uh you know contributions one is the mapping of the bro, uh kinship organizations in india it's supposed to certainly one of her most important works uh carve's first major book and for which she was perhaps best known was preceded by a number of articles examining kinship terminology and usages in different parts in india maharashtra gujarat karnataka tamil nadu and comparing them to terms and practices found in the vedas and the mahabharata sanskrit 
folk traditions. So this is an elaboration about how uh, she looked at kin uh, kinship patterns in in India, looking into you know different uh, linguistic uh, different variations. Kinship patterns are mapped onto linguistic zones to come up with the following variation: Indo-European or Sanskrit organizations in the northern zone, then Dravidian kinship in the southern zone, central zone of mixed patterns found in Maharashtra, and uh, Mundari kinship systems of the east. Within each linguistic region, there are variations between caste and subcaste. The unity in all the diversity was provided by the Shruti literature, that is Vedas, Brahmanas, Brahmas, Brahmanas and Upanishads and epics such as Mahabharata and Ramayana, which she reads as sociological and psychological status of the joint family in uh, ancient North India. So this uh, kinship organization, uh, though it was one of her major work was very vehemently criticized by uh, Dumo and Pocock. So that is what uh, is written here. However, the reputation of the book never quite recovered from the demolition job performed by Dumo and Pocock in the first uh, issue of contributions to Indian sociology, which charged Carvey with a lack of conceptual precision, insufficient localization of the kinship terms, uh, a haphazard clubbing of terms which make it difficult to say which term for father goes with which term for uncle and also makes a structural analysis impossible and an absence of an attention to what these kinship terms mean to people in practice. So they were very critical of her this work of, of this particular work. Very maybe very harsh characterization. It is an example of how valuable information can be sterilized for the use of future research by an imprecise formulation. Very, very uh, harsh criticism uh, indeed. Now, uh, some of these recent observations about uh, by uh, about Airavati Corvey, uh, while Trotman claims that his work was an extension of the historicist approach. Ubroi regards Carvey as a pioneer of the indigenous feminist perspective on the Indian family. Her central contrast uh, of North and South Indian kinship evolved, revolved around differences in marital arrangements as seen from the viewpoint of women, marriage with kin versus marriage with strangers, marriage close by versus marriage close by versus marriage at distance. Similarly, she evaluated modern changes in family life. For instance, the modification of Dravidian marriage practice in the direction of the in the direction of the northern model from the viewpoint of their possible effects on the women's life. Yeah, this all again Carvey's work uh, on caste is collected in, collected in Hindu society and interpretation. Though this book too was preceded by several articles on what caste mean culturally and anthropometrically. Uh, details about her work. Yeah, elaborations about uh, you know different articles, different ideas. I don't think that we need to. Uh, uh, go into the details and the next section is about uh, socio-economic surveys, the way she conducted survey. Significant part of Carvey's output is in the form of socio-economic surveys uh, or what today would be seen as an applied anthropology or policy studies. When the relationship between sociology and policy has always been contested, the dominance of Delhi school style of sociology over regions and the ethnography over statistical surveys uh, in the received national history has often tend to conceal these links that did exist. So, uh, you know, she, she was somebody maybe for the first time undertook, uh, you know, large scale surveys among, um, uh, among different castes and different religious group and later we lost track of that kind of a particular methodological uh, orientation, which, you know, came to be, uh, yeah, especially Delhi school was not something in favor for that. It's all descriptions about how uh, she went and then did very systematic works in, in, in different regions in the rural uh, Maharashtra in other places in, in uh, Faltan, 
villages others so yeah so then uh, nandini sundar comes with the kind of a conclusion about how uh, you know there is little doubt that iravadi carve so science as her vocation uh, almost the way equivalent of the social services in the university arena in concluding it might be useful to summarize what this vocation meant in the indian context in the critical middle decades of the last century so it's a concluding part given by uh, iravadi uh, by nandini sundar with uh, all this however science was her vocation because she had that uh, inward calling and enthusiasm and curiosity with which she engaged the world and a passion that still shines bright uh, for us these many decades later so uh, it's a very uh, you know lengthy essay i think around 60 uh, 57 pages uh, but provides you with a very uh, detailed information of uh, a scholar who uh, may be one of the front runners in establishing sociology and anthropology in india that were women uh, that that early period uh, so uh, uh, with a, with a, with a, with, a, with a set of you know intellectual uh, you know insights and intellectual curiosities shaped by the dominant trends of that particular time so yeah so uh, if you get an opportunity to read this essay read it uh, closely it's it's a very it's a very uh, interesting essay by bringing in the personal uh, and the professional dimensions of iravadi carve okay so let us uh, stop here thank you